every book have to go best selling to maintain that nope. status? You gotta hit it one time. Oh, I've hit true. it three. Okay. Yeah, so you only All have right. to do it one time and then you are forever then known it's, as then, it's, then it's forever. That's right. And you say you've it's made like, it three of the books have gone right. best selling? Right. What exactly determines or, or the definition of a bestseller? Does that be number one? No. No well it, it, it's not the question I thought you were going to ask. No, it does not. If you're number one, then you are number one New York Times bestselling author. Oh, I've never been there. I've, ne- I've never How been close there. have you gone? So, not very. I thought I was up to eight. Eight? Yeah. You eight? just have to be in the top ten or what? So, well, it, well, it depends. On, uh, generally, yes. But... <laughs> You can know it depends generally. Yes. Yeah, it, it, it's a it, this isn't something th- this is the, the marketing departments do this stuff, yeah. you know, so um, what, what nobody knows is how you actually get on the New York Times list because nobody knows the reporting bookstores, which are diminishing in numbers. Sure. That, that's mm-hmm. a carefully held secret. And there are books that open as number one on the New York Times list on their first day on sale. So. It can't be actual number of sales to people. So is it the buy-in from the bookstores into the bookstore? Or is is it the publicity of the number? I mean, is, we all know that John Grisham, Stephen King, and Jeffrey Deaver and some others are always going to be on the list. So does that get into the mix as well? The bottom line is no one knows. No. Hmm. I think Deaver's birthday was yesterday, wasn't it? It was. Yeah, I'm impressed. Top eight. I couldn't get top eight in my 25 uh, person class of uh, reading and writing in middle school. So I thought you could say I couldn't get top, top eight, eight in my top country. seven class. So, yeah, no, no. There were at least like 25 of us. Hey, it smells really good it in does. here right now. Matt, go ahead and hold on. Those <laughs> are close to you, man. I didn't yeah. know if you could smell them all the way over oh, yeah. there or not. Faith Hall yeah, brought in go. the pepperoni rolls. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just breathe that in, yeah. boys. Breathe that in. Yeah. I'd rather take it in, but we can't do that on the air. <laughs> 49 my, minutes to go. boy at the end. <laughs> minutes Steve Wendelin is our guest here on the program. He's a candidate for Congress. Steve, good morning to you. Good morning. Um, it's great to have me. I'm glad to hear I'm in your bonus hour because I'm kind of the bonus candidate. So, Sweet. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah man. I appreciate you having me in. Hey, uh, tell us your story. So here's the story. Um, spent 39 years in the U.S. Navy, uh, 29 of them active duty, 10 as a reservist. Um, and... I retired in September, September 1st. I retired after this very long career. Thought I would have my nice, quiet retirement in West by God, Virginia. And after I moved here, I started getting these mailers from my representative. And it's like, wow, this guy is kind of the definition of the problem. And uh, I just started kind of thinking about it a little bit. And then January 6th happened, and that kind of solidified Uh, that, you know, the old adage, if you don't vote, you can't complain. Mm -hmm. Well, because I don't need a second career, I can live comfortably off my retirement and my disability. So I realized if I don't run, I'm just kind of part of the problem. And like I said, after January 6th, not that that's the pure reason why I'm running, but that was definitely the catalyst, is that I've been all over the world and I've seen governments who govern like that. And we are not that we are a whole lot better than that. And, um, and so that's what inspired me to run. You spent 39 years in the Navy, 39 years in the Navy. Where, where did you go? What did you do? <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> I enlisted when I was uh, 18 and, and you grew up where Steve? I grew up in Northern California, uh, San Francisco Bay area, uh, kind of all around there enlisted uh, from Central California. I'm actually a high school dropout. This is kind of a fun fact about me. Dropped out of high school, yet I have two master's degrees there. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway. Um, so did you start as a swabby and go all the way up to I commander? Abs- I absolutely did. All right, good I for absolutely you. did. Yeah, not quite seaman to admiral, but close. Uh-huh. Uh, so uh, <laughs> seaman to commander. Yeah. Um, and so, um, yeah, enlisted when I was 18 because I didn't have that high school diploma. Uh, they would only accept me into the reserves. At least that's what the recor- recruiter told me. Um, I suspect he had maybe a different motive and really enjoyed it. But then I was in the reserves and realized that I wanted to make a career out of the Navy. And I was a delivery driver, did a bunch of odd jobs. So I was a delivery driver and kept driving by this place called the California Maritime Academy. One day I just pulled in and found out it was a four-year uh, uh, school. You get a Bachelor of Science, a Merchant Marine license, and if you want, a commission in the United States Navy. 
I think we commissioned about 10% of each graduating class. So um, I said, hey, why not? Uh, they said, well, you know, how do we know that you're going to be able to su succeed here? So I went and took the SAT. They liked the scores. And the admissions officer said, hey, you take one math course from a community college and pass it. We'll let you in. That's why I did. So it was kind of weird. During the week, I was midshipman Wendelin, and on the weekends, I was petty officer Wendelin. And I commissioned in 1990. And in 1992, promptly got rift, which uh, to the folks out there, it's essentially being laid off. There was a huge drawdown. So then I was out back in the reserves for another four and a half years, kept reapplying for active duty. So it was the big drawdown right after Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. And again, continued in the reserves. And then in 1996, finally came back on active duty as a lieutenant and just retired in 2023. So it's been a long career. I've served all over the country, all over the world, both coasts, stationed in the, in the United Kingdom for three years, also, what's kind of odd about being a sailor is I have 22 months boots on ground, uh, six months in Iraq, and then 12 months in Afghanistan, and then another four months in Afghanistan. And so it's, it's been a full career. And then what was really nice is towards the end of my career, I had the opportunity to work and teach at the United States Naval Academy. I did four years, and then my final year, I went back for that uh, last two semesters and taught uh, military ethics and then... Um, naval history that's awesome yeah can thank you for your service to the country sir. you're very very welcome for that yeah so and um i've recently read probably the best response is you're worth it cool and uh that's not mm -hmm. mine but i'm going to start using that because it was the first time anyone ever thanked me for my services was actually after 9 11 and they and they thanked me for, i didn't know quite how to respond to it it was like kind of awkward it's like uh, okay well <laughs> you're welcome and for a long time, I always wondered how to kind of respond to that. And, mm -hmm. and because I knew how I felt about it, but didn't ever really have a good response. So, yeah, mm -hmm. you're worth it. Now, yeah. it was uh, some tax policy that ultimately helped draw you to West Virginia. <laughs> it did. It did. I think it's the only uh, one of the few positive things I've come out, seen come out of the supermajority uh, down in Charleston. Yeah. Tell me the story. <laughs> of the tax policy? Yeah. What, what is it? How did you wind up in Hardy County? Well, basically, uh, just driving around, I, I probably looked up here for about six months, started out in Hampshire County, and just couldn't find the right place. Um, I didn't need a big place. It's just my wife and I, all my kids are grown, so um, only needed two bedrooms. And just couldn't find a place, kept looking for it. Didn't want anything with a property owners association or an HOA. Don't kind of, you know, don't kind of want to have to deal with those kind of politics <laughs> you took orders long <laughs> enough right? Yeah. and so that was one of the requirements and of course the other requirement is hey you need to be able to stand on the front porch and and take a leak uh if i if i need to and i think that's kind of the i'm gonna go in your the, side door the, if i ever visit you the, uh, the uh the <laughs> well we've got three doors you have to pick one but choose wisely yeah and um and finally found a beautiful place and it's it had everything that we needed um, and I'm also, you know, before I die, I want a mastery of one thing. I can do a lot of things really well, but I don't have mastery of anything. And so I've taken a blacksmithing. And so I have a small, uh, smithy on the uh, property. Cool. I'm not very good. I can make bottle openers. That's about it. But, uh, um, and if I'm elected, well, I'll have to push that back, uh, a little bit longer. Certainly. So, we'll but the, the tax policy reference I was bringing up was uh, you initially started to look at West Virginia because the yeah, legislature it, had passed a law. Passed a law that basically military retirement is tax-free. There is no income tax on it. You report it um, basically as income, but if you cite the sources, military retirement is tax-free. In addition, the other thing that they don't tax is anything that comes out of the thrift savings plan. So the military and federal ser uh, civil servants have something called the Thrift Savings Plan, which is the federal version of a 401k. And for the military, anything that we put in there when we, when we withdraw it, um, because it's just tax deferred, um, that's not taxed as well. So the only thing that I really pay taxes on is my federal income tax. And then of course, uh, disability from the Veterans Administration is, is always tax-free. John? So you're running as a Democrat. I am. So are you exhausted from your primary race? 
<laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny. You're talking about the primary. I, I was really kind of hoping someone would run against me. One, because that's how democracy works. That's how we get the best candidates forward is they have to go through that crucible of, of a primary. The other part of it, too, is this is not something I've always aspired to. It's not like I you know, was a child and said, oh, someday I want to be in Congress. You know, I had my career. I've had my job. Um, this is something that I feel compelled to do. And there was a part of me that was hoping that somebody a little bit more qualified and a little bit more electable than me would show up and, you know, I would run the primary and then I could say, Hey, this is a great guy. He, 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 you know, our great gal and they beat me fair and square and, and you really need to get the vote out. And filing day came and filing day went <laughs> and the closing of the filing period went and it's like ooh okay and i called up the head of the uh west virginia democratic party mike pushkin and i said hey uh mike i guess i'm the presumptive candidate he goes no you are the candidate so yes i am the democratic candidate for the second congressional district of west virginia a lot of people um there's some confusion since the redistricting um of first of all the southern half of the state is the first district the the northern half is the second is the second district and it's both panhandles the northern and the eastern panhandle and everything kind of in between the district goes from harper's ferry all the way to the ohio river it's huge it's 27 counties 10,000 square miles i made the mistake one week and i said i wonder how big this is and i started adding it up it, yeah it's 10,000 square miles and it's it's huge we had zach shrewsbury on <clears throat> earlier today and he's a democrat uh, candidate mm -hmm. for the u.s senate and I asked him, I'll ask you the same questions. How do you overcome the, the national party, of the National Democratic Party, the, the one in Washington, the one mm -hmm. where you'll be the junior est member of if, if you get elected? It stands for a lot of uh, things that the average West Virginia does not stand for. They're, they're yep. anti-gun, they're anti-coal, they're pro-abortion, the, you know, all of that stuff. Okay. And that's kind of where you're going to be forced to hang your hat, whether or not you personally agree with that. Well, first of all, do you personally agree with those? And secondly, how do you how do you separate yourself and, and still have the, the support of the party? Okay, a lot of unpacking that question there. So first, let me start by, um, you know, hanging my hat there. So I'm a lifelong Democrat. And I have been to a Republican event, I got invited. And I was very well received. And, and a lady came up to me and said, everything you've said sounds kind of very Republican-esque. And I said, yeah. And she said, well, why don't you change parties? And I said, well, because I'm a lifelong Democrat and my values don't necessarily align with the current Republican kind of thing that's going on. And to change parties just to get elected, what would that say about my character? And we have a real problem in the state with people flipping parties just to get elected, a real problem with it. So I'm not gonna do that, lifelong Democrat. Um, but here's the thing, on Facebook, you know, from you know, way off when, back in the day, they used to say, well, what is your political whatever? Well, I list myself as a rabid moderate. And that's what I am. Um, I'm a centrist, I'm a moderate. Um, and I firmly believe that 80% of us regardless of party, can agree on 80% of the policies. The other 20% we'd probably find out pretty good compromises for. And it's the 10% on either end that are causing the problems. And I, I won't say it's the left or the right. It's both sides have their turn at it. And Rob, I heard you talk to another guest about, well, you know, the only thing in the center is a uh, uh, center of the road is yellow lines and roadkill. Oh, that was our introduction <laughs> oh, for Bill. Oh, no, that uh, wasn't, no, it was me, but it was yeah, our, it last was, Friday, the introduction uh, yeah. for Bill Stubblefield. Yes, yes exactly. Uh, for, for, the, for the Admiral and, and okay, got it. The only thing in the, in the center of the road is, is yellow lines and roadkill. And the thing on the outside of, of the road is a ditch with a totaled car driven by drunk, you know, circus clowns. So it's a lot to unpack there. Steve. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'll stick to the center of the road. Um, it's, it's, it's a better place. It's safer I, in the lane though. Steve. Well, yeah. And I'll, and I'll be in the lane, but you can change lanes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And it, it, so, and we all just need to be moving in the same direction. So anyway, so 
as far as hanging my hat with you know the national democrats here's the thing i don't work for the national democrats if i'm elected i work for the people of west virginia and not just the democrats of west virginia all west virginians and that's one of the things that that turned me off of our current representative so much is he only panders to his particular base so so yeah i'm going to do what's right for west virginia not what's right for the democrats and again nationally the other thing too is like i said i would be elected and sent to washington by west virginians one of the things they say well you know if you get elected you have to spend so many hours a day fundraising and you have to you know do this do that what are they going to do to me give me the smallest office i don't care take away my parking spot well i need the exercise all right i'll walk i don't care i'm not going to be beholden to anybody yes there is there is a structure with the speaker and the whips and the majority leaders and the minority leaders and all that got it but you know what i don't care <laughs> i'm going to vote what what i think is right and what how my constituents want me to vote on a particular issue and i'm going to take it issue by issue so for that now you ask me well where do i stand on on some of these other things well there's anti the perception of the Democratic Party, right. anti-fossil fuel. Okay, so so let's get into that a little bit. Um, I'm a numbers guy, and I've been doing a lot of research since doing this. And I call it the myth of coal, okay? Do you know what percentage coal employs in West Virginia? Off the top of your head. I do not. Yeah, it's about 7%, okay? I'm sorry, West Virginia, coal's dead. It really is. And it's not because of the tree huggers or anybody like that. It's simply the energy companies have found cheaper ways of extracting fuel out of the ground than sending, you know, people down into mines or taking the tops of mountains off. Here's the deal. Um, coal built this country. It won two world wars. It's awesome. I understand it's very emotional for people because dad was in the mines. Grandpa was in the mines. I get it. And let's build a huge monument to the coal workers of West Virginia. I get it. But it's it's not coming back. And because simply there are cheaper ways of extracting fuel out. So to make policy over something that's emotional like that isn't the right way to make a policy. Um, and I firmly believe that. So, you know, we do need to look at other things. The other thing about West Virginia I've learned, too, is West Virginia is really good at, at exporting its wealth. First, we exported all of our timber. Then we exported all of its coal. Now we're exporting its people. And everyone gains except for West Virginia. We need to reverse that. And until we reverse those policies to get people coming back into the state, or better yet, just staying in the state, that's what we need to do. And we need to make it more attractive for people to come here. You know, we are hemorrhaging people. We, that's how we're down to only two congressional districts. We've lost that many people that it cost us a seat in the House of Representatives. Then why not be running at the state level as opposed to the federal level? So <laughs> this is going to be a horrible sound bite. I can hear all the people that support me cringe. Dylan, make sure we're recording uh, right now. <laughs> I'm, people said that. Well, why not the local or, or, or state level? Well, one, it's not what I'm I'm drawn to. It's you know, like I said, it's you know that that the current federal is where I see the biggest problem. Also, I'm not qualified for the local or state level. Um, I haven't been in West Virginia. I've been in West. I've been a West Virginian for five years. And, you know, I'd rather leave that up to the people who have been born and raised here. I am, however, incredibly qualified at the federal level. Spent 39 years in the military, 39 years in the Department of Defense. I know how the fiscal cycle is supposed to work and how it doesn't work. I've also seen, oh, my God, the waste, the absolute waste. I'm probably the one candidate that can get away with saying this. And that is if we just cut the waste in the Department of Defense, we could fund everything else. We could absolutely fund everything else without raising taxes. I firmly believe that. And the waste is just, it's its almost like the waste is incentivized. Well, it is incentivized um, from everything we do. 
The other problem we have too is, is the budget cycle, which is completely busted. The last time we passed a budget on time was 1997. The last time it was balanced was 2001. It wasn't, ba it wasn't on time, but it was balanced, so I give them points for that. Every time there's a continuing resolution that helps our readiness military-wise, but also it costs us an inordinate amount of money, and it's hugely wasteful. Congress has got one job, one job per the Constitution, and that is to fiscally run this country. And they conduct malpractice because they're running around talking about all these social issues rather than balancing the budget. And people are saying, oh, this guy's a Democrat? Yeah, I am. I'm a fiscal conservative. I'm a Democrat. Uh, on my website, I, I describe myself as a blue dog. And oh, I remember uh, that term. That's <laughs> about 25 years ago. Yeah, well, I'm bringing it back. Yeah. Uh, Matt Miller, um, you, you also mentioned uh, health care reform. What's the challenge with being able to reform health care on that national level? But at the same time, you mentioned balancing a budget. Th th that sounds like uh, two things that will be very uh, hard to do at the same time. Well, not necessarily. So the government is not particularly good at running things. What mm -hmm. they're really good at is policy and regulation. And, you know, the Affordable Care Act got it get all the politics behind it and should there be a kind of national health insurance for you know the people that can't afford anything else sure here's the deal we and we've done this already is by regulation and policy first of all it's time to bring back trust busting all right uh, back at the turn of the 19th century it was you know standard oil and steel and we busted up those monopolies. Well, guess what? The trusts are now. They're, they're healthcare and they're big pharma. Mm. So that's what the federal government needs to do, is go in and bust that. There shouldn't be negotiated rates, one for people paying out of pocket and the other one for the medical insurance. All right, there should be one rate. We did this on a small scale with insulin, where the federal government said, we are going to cap this. Well, guess what? If they can do it on that, they can do it on everything to include a night in the hospital to the cost of an aspirin and all this other stuff and eliminate basically the monopolies and the trust by breaking that. I trust me, I've been in the government. You don't want the government running your health care. But what they can do is make is level the playing field for everybody and make it affordable. And that's. So I'm not, I'm not into the whole idea of socialized medicine or anything like that. I mean, you know, sure, we can learn from other countries. But the big thing is if we just simply leveled the playing field for, you know, you and me um, so we could, you know, be able to afford and even self-insure if you wanted to. But the idea of, of you know, being paying all this money for insurance and you still get these huge bills in the end and people going bankrupt because they had the misfortune of, you know, having cancer or being in an auto accident is horrible. You, you, no one should ever be bankrupt from getting sick. That's just wrong. All right. And that's, and that's where the federal government needs to step in. Follow up question, Matt. I was just going to ask if there's an issue that that's on your heart and mind that's that's a part of your your being compelled to run that maybe we haven't hit on so far. The big thing is on the ballot there needs to be a choice, and when West Virginia we've been having this problem with with even filling out you know um, getting enough people to run. So these races aren't unopposed. The other thing too, is this is really weird. Congress has an incredibly low approval rating. It's like 15%, something like that. I'm surprised it's that high. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I think Fidel Castro's Cuba was at like 8% um, you know, approval rating. So yeah, 15%, let's say. Yet an incumbent has a 90% chance of being reelected. Okay, folks, you need to look in the mirror because they're not appointing themselves, all right? Someone is voting for them. And the idea is, well, it's all those other jokers, but you know, I like my congressman. No, 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 no. Do you really know your congressman? You know, do you know your elected representatives? Do you know your delegates? Do you know what they're voting for? Do you know who's in their, whose pocket they're in? 
you know, who is funding them? Oh, there we go. Yeah, I, I did. Thank you. You, you reminded <laughs> me. <laughs> so I don't call it the biggest problem. I call it the first problem. And the first problem is money in politics. It needs to stop. It's insane. And I've got a couple ideas how to fix it, but just to throw out some numbers, my most likely opponent in November raised $600,000 before he even filed. He is at right now $800,000, um, $20,000 of it from Charles Koch. Okay. He's bought and paid for the second, uh, guy who's running, who I might be running against has already raised $500,000. That's insane. What kind of promises do you have to make to earn that kind of money? Even like, you know, assessors races and things like that, you know, people are running or earning, not earning, they're raising sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 to be an assessor. We've got to get the money out of politics. So one of the things I want to do is just Except for buying trans- ads on radio. Except for buying <laughs> ads on radio. Absolutely. I think, matter of fact, Maybe that's what we need to do is just limit the only advertising that you're allowed to pay for is ads on radio. Hmm. But we'll, we'll have to have a, a cap on it. All right. <laughs> Unlimited. Uh, <laughs> Unlimited. <laughs> Steve, we are, we are just about out of time here. I want to ask you one final question before we take our uh, commercial break here. And that on, you mentioned choice earlier. Uh, you have uh, pro-choice is being listed on your uh, uh, flyer that you have here in a state that is having a race to go as far right restrictive with abortion rights as possible. How can you possibly get elected in this state as a pro-choice candidate? Well, because I think probably if this was a um, referendum, which uh, Mayor Steve Williams is working on getting a referendum, I think we need to let the people choose where the state goes, not the legislators. All right. That's one. Two, um, the one thing that West Virginians really don't like is government overreach. And I can't think of the ultimate overreach is when you're reaching into somebody's pants. Sorry. Okay. Mountaineers are free. All right. Mountaineers should be free to choose. All right. And that's, that's why I feel about it. And I'm not going to hide from that. Uh, final uh, minute is yours. Uh, how do people find out more about your campaign? So um, it's Stephen Wendelin for Congress.com um, is my website. Please go to the website. Uh, please, this is very grassroots. If you like what you see, share it with your friends. Um, if you don't like what you see, keep it to yourself. Um, <laughs> but I think you're going to like what you see. And the other part of this, too, is if you can't remember my name, Stephen Wendelin, and it's sometimes people know don't know how to spell it, that sailor, all one word, dot com will get you to my website. You are the only Democratic <laughs> candidate in uh, District 2, Congressional District 2. I so am. So you will go all the way to the... Uh, General in November. I'm going to the general. Guaranteed to get about 100% of the vote in the primary. I I certainly hope so. (laughs) Uh, Thank you for dropping by. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And again, uh, Steve Wendland, candidate for Congress.